So uh, we've waited a few minutes here. Let's kick this off. So maybe we should introduce ourselves. Um, I'm George. I'm uh, with the marketing group at FFM Video. And who are you, Dave? <laughs> <laughs> so I'm also with the marketing group at FFM Video. Uh, so George and I work together on all kinds of things. Um, and uh, my primary responsibility is is on the marketing side. So it's it's you know reaching out to customers, finding out what they're doing and trying to reflect that back into the products that we're designing and then you know communicating what we're doing internally out to customers so george and i are always uh working on that together yeah um so, so maybe we can pull up our is it our agenda that we're going to kick things off with sure let's do that um okay um so for today's webinar we're going to cover what is SRT? So hopefully if if you're joining this, you have some idea of what SRT is, but we're gonna get into more details about exactly what SRT is and, and what you need to know about it. Um, and specifically, we're looking at how SRT works for remote gas. And by that, we mean if you're doing a production and you want to bring in somebody from a remote location using SRT, how does that work? And, wh and why is it not a, a good solution or a good idea? Um, then we'll take a quick look at why you might want to use something like Pearl when you're, when you're doing that, when you're bringing in remote gas or you're producing productions with SRT. We'll take a look at the capabilities Pearl brings to the table uh, for people wanting to use SRT. And we'll take a little bit of time, not a lot, but a little bit to delve in a little bit on the details of configuring it on Pearl. So we'll give you a glimpse as to, you know, how simple or complicated it is just to get an SRT stream set up. Um, and what it looks like in the Pearl UI. So we've got some screen captures we'll share there and we'll walk through. And then of course, at the end, we've got time for questions and we expect people will have lots of questions. So do use the question section on the Crowdcast there to enter your questions and you can upvote questions. If you see the ones that you're interested in, you can upvote those so we know to, to make sure we get around to those. But we'll, we'll try to leave lots of time at the end for, for your questions so we can have mm -hmm. a good discussion uh, with, with whatever you'd like to talk about. So a couple of comments in the chat already. People are noticing that the quality looks really good and that's that's a good observation and that's because we're using SRT. So we'll explain how we're doing this broadcast. Dave and I are both remote. I'm in my house, Dave's in his house. Um, yep. And our Pearl that's producing this is in another place altogether. So uh, we'll walk right. through all of that in as much detail as you'd like. Perfect. Um, yeah, so let's start with the first topic. What is SRT? Um, so SRT was developed by High Vision um, initially as a proprietary protocol for them. And then a while back, maybe two and a half years ago, they made it completely open and public. So they made it open source. They wanted to create an alliance, which they did, the SRT Alliance. And Wowza and, and High Vision were the, the kind of initial founders there. And they wanted to make sure that this was a protocol that would that would really uh, you know proliferate through through the industry. And the three kind of things we're touching on here is it is a low latency protocol. So we'll look at, at that in a minute in terms of what do we mean by low latency and how low is, is low. It's quite firewall friendly. So we know that especially if you're bringing in remote guests or those kind of workflows, um, you're going to be going through firewalls either at the studio side or at the guest side or both. Um, and then security is always uh, something that people are concerned with, uh, especially with contribution feeds. So you want to make sure that those are secure. Um, and SRT really uh, provides for all of those. And it's a protocol that was driven for this kind of use case. Um, so it was designed from the ground up to say, how do we move video contribution video uh, around the network, knowing that the network's a little bit unpredictable, how do we do that in a way that works well and is easy to use? So that's that's really you know where it came from, and and what it's all about. If we take a look at from a latency point of view, um, this is more from a from a HD cable TV kind of view, um, but it shows the different protocols there. You see HLS and RTMP. Um, all these protocols that you're probably quite familiar with if you're already joining this webinar. SRT is definitely one that's in the lower latency category and by that we mean sub one second. Uh, one of the nice 
attributes of SRT is it does allow you to make a trade-off between latency and quality over your unpredictable or your, I'll call it misbehaving network. So you can trade, you can introduce a little more latency to make up for whatever packet loss or jitter that you have in the network that you're transporting that contribution feed over. Um, so that's why it does cover a range. You can get it down much, much less than one second, um, but that that requires that you have a very well-behaved network with low packet loss and jitter. Um, as your packet becomes, or as your network becomes a little less packet friendly and starts dropping some of those or introducing jitter between packets, then you can increase that latency as a little bit to compensate. And we'll get into those details a little later when we look at how to set up an SRT connection. Um, but mm -hmm. it is meant to be relatively low latency to something like HLS. Now, and in terms of the context of this webinar, when we're talking about how to bring in... Oh, yes. Why is it that... Um... Oh, look at this. Now I'm looking, we're looking at our Zoom feed right, feed right now as a comparison. So we had a little toggle back there. You could see our, 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 our back channel where we actually are also using Zoom as a, as a backup. Um, so that's what you just saw on our live broadcast there. And now we're back on our SR2 stream. Um, yep. But for a remote guest uh, production like we're doing today, why is latency such a consideration? Well, I think if you want to have a very natural two-way conversation with a guest, um, then latency is something you need to consider because every time that conversation hands back and forth from one person to the other, you, any extra latency there is going to cause you to have to wait or you're going to be tripping over each other. So if, if you're actually going to converse with the guest in real time, then latency needs to be low enough to have a natural conversation. Uh, on the other hand, if you're just throwing it to a guest and say, okay, this person's going to perform for five minutes and there's no interaction going on, in that case, you can get away with a lot more latency and you can just let them do their performance or present what they're going to present and then cut back to to the host or, or the producer at the end of that segment. And if there's not some true kind of two-way communication going on in real time, then you can use latency as a tool to, to guard against packet loss and other things. So the one nice thing about SRT is it does allow you to make that trade off. Um, and in some cases you really care about getting that latency as low as possible. And in other cases, it's probably not, not such a big deal. So that point about the trade off, I think, am I right, Dave, in that SRT is the only protocol that allows you to um, control your latency it's kind of like scales. You have latency and quality of service on, on, on one side, and you get to toggle those to decide how much quality you want. Uh, and if you want really high quality, you have to increase your latency. And if you're willing to sacrifice on your quality, then you can then get really, 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 really high latency. So are there other yeah, protocols that support similar kind of uh, exchange? Not really, not, not any that I'm familiar with that bring it to the user level. Um, yes, so, okay. you know, there are protocols that will run over TCP, for example, which has a packet retransmission and that kind of thing. Um, and it will automatically measure the, the round trip time or the latency and it'll try to adjust automatically. But the user has no control over that. So if that changes in real time, that protocol tries to adapt. Um, but it's pretty well known that, that TCP is not a great way to transmit video. It works really well for file transfers and you know web transfers and that kind of thing. But when you're dealing with live video, it's not the best control mechanism or transport mechanism for transporting that video. And that's really where SRT came from. That's why High Vision invented it in the first place. Some other protocols just go over UDP, which has no retransmission. And then you just deal with the fact that the destination end may just lose packets and not be able to recover them. And so SRT allows you to to trade that off and say, no, I'm going to introduce a little latency, but it gives me the ability to do that retransmission um, and gives the user control over how much latency they're willing to tolerate in order to gain resiliency uh, against packet loss. Right. Yeah. Uh, we found with our, our Zoom broadcasts previously where we're using Zoom uh, to bring in our footage into our broadcasts. And of course, you get excellent latency uh, with a conferencing platform. But uh, as we saw earlier, the quality is just nowhere near as high as you get with something like SRT. You also don't get anywhere near the kind of control that you really need um, 
when working Correct. with a video. So uh, yeah, it's pretty great. So this is exactly so just on the charts here, if we can go back to that, um, this is exactly the setup that that we're talking about is when you're trying to bring in um, a remote guest or a remote feed over an unpredictable network. And by unpredictable, we're talking about jitter or the the arrival time variation of packets at the head end, as well as just packet loss um, packets that may get um, may get, uh, you know, congestion in the network may actually discard those packets and you may never see them. They need to be retransmitted. Um, so the way SRT works is from here, we're showing Perl Mini as the contribution encoder and it's sending it up to the destination, to the CDN. In this case, that's the way your video is traveling, but the dashed line represents the feedback coming from the network that shows you will see what the packet loss is and you will get statistics and there will be requests for retransmission should any of those packets have been lost. So it, it really is a two-way protocol. Um, the video is traveling one way, but you're getting feedback from the network that tells you what the packet loss is and whether or not uh, it's performing well. And that's, that's another nice um, kind of feature of SRT is when you're setting up that connection, you actually get statistics that you can view that tell you whether or not you've tuned it well for the conditions you have. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, it doesn't do anything about dogs barking in the background or people knocking on your front door when you're doing live streams from your house, but it does a lot of pretty powerful things. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but not everything. Exactly. Um, so the other thing that, that, you know, we found, and the reason that we announced uh, Pearl having support for SRT when we did, is that it's really gained a lot of momentum in the industry. And we see a, a really large number of vendors that have joined the, the SRT Alliance that was started um, with High Vision and Wowza. And we've got some very big players, as you can see there, guys like Avid and Microsoft and, and the likes of them. But this is really just a small sample of the logos. We could not even possibly fit the hundreds of logos uh, on a single slide here. So there really are, um, you know, a large number of, of uh, industry players that have joined this alliance. And many of them are equipment manufacturers in one way or another, whether it's software or hardware. And we're finding more and more products are coming online all the time that have SRT built in. Um, and there was recently a plug fest hosted by uh, the SRT Alliance, which was a way for all of these vendors to send each other SRT streams and check interoperability between their implementation and their equipment and each other. Uh, and we participated in that and it was great. We got to test our stuff with all kinds of different vendors, whether they were cameras or software encoders or CDNs or, you know, all kinds of streaming platforms. So it was a really great way to, to kind of jump in and be able to test with all kinds of guys. So the, the ecosystem is, is growing very, very rapidly, which makes the protocol, um, sort of useful in the marketplace, right? If there's only a small number of vendors that really support it, it becomes this kind of niche thing that, that some people will get to and other people will just ignore. But uh, SRT has really gained enough momentum and enough kind of critical mass in the industry that just about everybody is, is joining in. Yeah, it kind of seems like it came out of nowhere. I don't remember, a year ago we were talking about it, but uh, lately there's just so many people uh, asking about it. And especially as soon as COVID came, right? Um, we're all wanting yes. to do remote production, so. Yeah, um, that is and, certainly, yeah, that certainly accelerated things. We had lots of people over the last year or even year and a half asking us, you know, how are we looking at SRT? Are we gonna add it to our products? Are we gonna join the Alliance? And it was always something that we felt we would do it was just a matter of time and we wanted to join when the momentum had kicked in, not too early when you're just a mm -hmm. few players and no one can really make use of it. Um, so we feel the time is definitely now where there's enough uh, kind of critical mass of industry players that it makes sense uh, for this technology to be, yeah. to be part of our portfolio. Yeah, we could see it with the NFL, I'm sure, probably fast-tracked their testing with SRT to do their NFL draft this year. So that was one of the early wins for the SRT uh, Alliance to show that, yes, this is ready for prime time. And right. they, they proved that through a broadcast with as high a profile um, and 
you know, they're not going to take any chances with an event like this. It has to work flawlessly. And they felt enough confidence in SRT that they could make it work. And they did. So they had, I, I, I forget how many people, 600 people all SRTing up to their cloud and managing an entire production remotely. So that was a pretty yeah. impressive event. Yeah, it's great to see them be able to do it at this scale. I mean, we don't expect any of our customers will be at, at this scale trying to bring in 600 feeds but it really gives you good confidence that the protocol is ready um, and that it can be used for very high, high profile events. It, it is, you know, it's supposed to be reliable. That's part of its name and it is um, mm -hmm. so much so that these, these kind of organizations feel comfortable putting their prime broadcast uh, in its hands. Um, another sure. yeah. really great example is NASA. So High Vision worked with NASA and for the SpaceX launch, and use SRT for the video of that. So again, another high profile event here, they didn't have, you know, 600 feeds or, or that kind of scale. Um, but again, it's a very high profile event with, with, um, with very important, uh, you know, you only get one chance to kind of broadcast something like a SpaceX launch. So it's a, again, a, a critical thing and SRT was trusted to do it and, and did a great job. Um, let's talk a little bit more about how SRT works for those, for those guest productions. So how you bring somebody into your production, um, when they're remote and you want to get a higher quality, you know, we talked about zoom, just not having that high audio and video quality. So how do you use SRT? What does that look like? Um, we have a couple diagrams here, um, just showing the basic setup. Uh, so in this case we're using our products to represent Pearl Mini at the edge is representing that remote guest who could be in their home or in their office in some other city. It could be distance really isn't a huge factor. And, and again, part of that trade off you can do for latency is, is for that round trip time or that distance. So if you're in the same kind of city, likely your round trip time will be quite low. Uh, if you're, bringing in someone from Germany and you're in San Francisco, your round trip is going to be a little bit higher. Uh, but SRT can handle both of those cases um, pretty easily. And then on the head end, we're showing Pearl 2 as the kind of production encoder where that remote feed is coming in and where the production is actually being done. Um, so this is kind of a, a simple diagram, but kind of shows SRT both on the kind of output side of, of the Pearl Mini where you're sending it out to the to the encoded site and then on the on the production side where you're ingesting that feed on a Pearl 2. Yeah, SRT really stands apart from other streaming protocols, doesn't it? I mean, a lot of people think of SRT as a, simply a, a replacement, a new and improved version of RTMP. And while it is that, uh, RTMP was never really designed for this kind of uh, encoder decoder situation like we're able to do with our Perl systems here uh, for sending and receiving content. And so it's pretty flexible that way. Um, and as I understand, it's also, it's, it itself is not, it accepts any kind of video format or video codec as well, right? Isn't that right, Dave? It is, it's, it's, it's codec agnostic, um, mm -hmm. so you know, when we, when we did, for example, that plug fest with, with all of those different vendors, um, you did have to kind of identify which codecs you're putting inside your stream. So people could say, okay, I support these codecs. I should be able to talk to that particular endpoint. Um, but it is codec agnostic. So you can put any codec you like inside there. Of course, H.264, H.265 are very popular ones. But it isn't. It doesn't specify the codec, so you are free. It is really just a transport protocol. You are free to use whatever codecs you like um, on top of that protocol. Mm -hmm. And so what we're looking at here is pretty much what we're doing today. Well, we have a more detailed version of this, which we'll show you later. Um, uh, and this is all basically pushing. So there's not a lot of receiving going on here. But all these three Pearl Minis that are in this diagram are pushing content to that Perl 2, which we'd consider the production system, okay? So it could be a Perl 2 that you have a production system. It could be some cloud-based production system that you're working with uh, as well. And it doesn't really matter. Um, SRT is really agnostic, like you said, that way. It's also agnostic in terms of those could be Perl minis at one end capturing that footage, or it could be a software-based uh, 
encoder as well. There's many ways to push and receive SRT. Um, our core systems are unique, but um, and we'll get into that a little bit more about why they're a good solution for this, but there's a few other ways to do this. So be sure to do a little research before you get started. Sure. Yeah, it's not always um, necessarily the perfect choice, uh, but we're going to talk about where and when Perl is the right choice for SRT. Yeah. And as you mentioned, George, that there are different options. So it's, you saw on the, on the SRT Alliance slide, there's vendors from all across the industry that are supporting SRT. So there's many ways to kind of generate that SRT stream and, and contribute that feed. Um, so here we're showing a similar kind of workflow um, where it's uh, a Pearl Mini or here we've drawn a camera. So there are some some cameras, just pure cameras in the field that, that will support um, sending SRT. And here we, we have a broadcast center. So the idea is we're going up into our broadcast and um, onto a CDN after that. And that's pretty much what we're doing today. So it, that could be just an SRT camera. That could be software. There's a lot of choices for what you're using at the edge. Um, but the idea is that you can bring that, that contribution feed in any way you'd like and then be able to process it at the receiving end and do your production from there. Um, we talk about there is, you know, a wide range of different uh, equipment from hardware encoders like our Perl family to software encoders like vMix or OBS. Um, there's even some apps on that will run on an iPhone and these kind of things that will both receive or send SRT. So there really is a wide range of choices out there um, when you're trying to figure out how do I bring that remote feed in? For what sort of device or software is my remote guest going to be operating so that they can contribute that SRT feed to the production? I think um, we'll take just a minute here for those of you who are maybe a little familiar with SRT but not familiar with Perl to just talk about what these products are so we can get into you know, how SRT is supported on them and how you set that up. Um, so Perl 2 and Perl Mini are are all-in-one production system so they pull together um, you know some mixing functionality some recording functionality streaming uh, and all of the capture so it really brings those four things together and really meant to be easy to use that's that's kind of the the key one here is it's a dedicated box that has capture cards built in if you like and has all of the software and everything else you need inside um, to be able to do all of your encoding and streaming and mixing and recording. Um, so it becomes a production box, whether used at the edge to contribute or used more at the core to receive multiple feeds and, and generate the broadcast. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we have customers who talk about using Perl like the most obvious use case is someone who's using a Perl as that production switcher. But if you just want to send out an encoder to your remote guest, you could in fact send them that Perl Mini or Perl 2 and control it remotely. So for a remote guest contribution, it's a really simple way. If you just want to send the kit to them and not have them worry about it, all they have to do is plug in an Ethernet cable uh, and get internet access to it. And then you as a producer can control the whole thing. So for those of you involved in live event production here today, I can imagine a workflow like that uh, might be beneficial for you. Yeah, you really don't want the the remote guest to be to need to be kind of AV aware, right? Their expertise mm -hmm. might be in some completely different field, and so being able to give them a piece of kit that's super easy to use and that you can control and manage um, makes things very easy. Here we're showing a couple different versions. Um, so we've got the Pearl Two on the top, uh, and you can see the back of it. There's lots of AV ports there, including some analog audio across the top, and then a range of HDMI, SDI, USB network inputs. So a whole range of ways you can bring video into the Pearl 2, including SRT over that network port. Um, and then we've got the little brother to that, which is our Pearl Mini, uh, which has a similar set of I.O., but to scale down a little bit. So if you don't need you know, you're not bringing in six cameras or that kind of thing, uh, or you're doing it at the edge just to capture somebody's a couple cameras and a microphone or that kind of thing, uh, then a Pearl Mini does that really, really well. So um, we have a couple different products that are aimed at 
kind of different tasks or different scale. And uh, often we see Pearl Mini at the edge and Pearl 2 being kind of that, that encoder that receives those remote feeds and then can do more of the actual production. So just a reminder uh, to everybody, uh, we have a lot of questions happening right now in the polls. So this latest question is, to what extent do you see yourself leveraging SRT in the future? Uh, we have questions about how many guests you want to bring in if you are to do a, a live production. So uh, click at the bottom of your window in Crowdcast and cast your vote. It only takes a second. And then we can all kind of see what where we're headed and, and maybe cater our answers for, for for the bulk of the group here. So I can see obviously a lot of people in the live event production industry and not a lot of people here have used SRT yet, which is not really a surprise. I guess that's why you're tuning in today. 87% um, say they, they plan to use SRT in the future. So wow. uh, Great. hopefully we can give you a few insights there. And uh, people here are saying they often bring in uh, guests to their video productions. Over 72% say they often bring in remote guests. Wow, so, that's fantastic. Um, I think you'll love SRT for when you, when you dive into SRT for that, you're gonna be really excited about it because not only is it super high quality, Dave, you and I, we set up for today's thing last night and it was really easy. Yeah, It was as easy as entering an RTMP streaming key and away we went. Um, with of course, some more options to configure it all we wanted, but the basic setup took, you know, I was given one string to copy and paste into my encoder and then I was streaming, so. Uh, you're gonna like it. Yeah, it can um, be very simple. Um, and one it of can the, be, yeah. And mm -hmm. one of the key elements when you're using something like a Perl uh, to do that streaming, if you choose to use Perl Mini, say at the edge to bring that remote guest in, is that your producer can control that completely um, from their from their location. So when you're sending that Pearl Mini out to, let's say you bring in maybe a musician or something as a guest on a show, they only need to be able to plug in a couple of cables, just a microphone and a camera and a network. And that's it. Once they've done that, the producer can take over remotely and configure everything else that has to go on that Pearl Mini. So even though it's quite simple to set up an SRT connection, one of the values Pearl Mini uh, brings with our AV Studio uh, access is the ability for the producer to do all of that setup for the guest. So the guest doesn't need to be going through menus or be walked through which URLs to copy or any of that. They don't need to know any of that. Um, that can all be done by the remote producer. So someone who's familiar with how to configure the Pearl, uh, you can send it out to them. They just really need to plug in a couple physical cables and then you're ready to, to kind of get them set up for the production. Mm -hmm. Um, now we're going to look a little bit about how to how to do that, how to configure um, some of the parameters that you need for SRT on a Perl and what that looks like and sort of how complex or easy that is. So these are a couple screen captures that we did earlier when we were just setting up uh, the connections that we have going today. Um, so on the left hand side, that's our full UI, sort of the left hand side of that slide. Uh, is what you would see as you open the um, the page for SRT in our web UI. And on the right hand side is just kind of a zoom in or a crop of the section that pertains to the, the elements you need to fit in and some of the statistics that you get back. Um, so it's worth noting SRT supports a couple of different modes um, when it's trying to establish a connection. And so there's a listener mode, a caller mode, and a rendezvous mode. And we're not gonna get into a lot of the details here, but basically they're, they're different ways of establishing or initiating the connection. Um, so a caller will always initiate the, the session. A listener will never do so. So you can set up a pair of devices, either you know the remote guest one or the studio one doesn't matter which is the source and which is the destination, either can be set up as a listener or a caller. And in that case, the listener is really just listening, waiting for the caller to kind of communicate with it and start that session. Um, or there's what they call the rendezvous mode, where both devices kind of peek out and, and try to find one another, and either one can initiate the call. Um, so mm -hmm. as soon as they're both kind of identified, they can talk to one another. And really the choice on how you want to set these up depends a little bit about 
the network you're in, maybe some firewall um, kind of properties and how much control you have over the network. So as we get into the, the settings a little bit below those statistics, um, you can see we've selected rendezvous mode and there's a URL that you need to enter there. Um, and the URL, uh, part, of the, part of that URL is the, the IP address of the destination. So here we're looking at my Pearl Mini that's sending to the Ottawa studio. And so I've entered the IP address. Um, we, we've kind of blocked that out, but we've, um, you enter the IP address and a port number that indicates the destination that you're trying to send to. Um, and that is really, that's the minimal amount of information you need in the rendezvous mode. And in that case, both, both the receiving uh, SRT device and the sending SRT device would need just each other's IP address and you choose a port that they will communicate over. And that's really all you need to get the connection started. Um, so over a good network, you'll get an instant connection once you enter that information and, mm -hmm. and basically start the stream. So that's what Dave and I did last night. And really, like I said, it took two minutes. We came in here, we found our IP addresses, figured out which port we wanted to use, um, and it worked immediately. So I think for probably 90% of the time, you're gonna use this mode and it's gonna be fine. Uh, and then it's gonna get more interesting when you have firewall issues to talk about. So one of our questions here, Dave, that maybe you can address from Chris Colvin, he's asking, what about network setup at the guest end? Will Perl now navigate ports or firewalls on the guest router so they don't need networking knowledge? So does your guest need to know about which ports are open, that kind of thing? Generally not. Um, so uh, especially in the rendezvous mo mode, if you set it up that way, or if the um, if the guest machine is the caller, so it's sending out through the firewall rather than needing to receive a message in from the firewall. Um, that's usually the easiest way uh, so that uh, a lot of times the firewall will block incoming traffic, but not necessarily the corresponding outgoing traffic. So if you set it to caller mode or rendezvous mode, um, it can reach out and try to establish a, a connection without modifying things on the firewall. Now, there are cases where where that won't work. There, there could be, um, if you're doing a pretty deep packet inspection on your router or that kind of thing, um, that may need to be tweaked so that these packets can get through and establish a connection. But mm -hmm. in general, uh, for most people's kind of home setup or corporate setup, um, we're going over uh, kind of well-known ports and, and you can just set that up pretty quickly. Um, and a few more questions related to that. Um, uh, so any ports in particular? So no, it's, it doesn't care which ports. You can choose any port. Am I right there? Yes. <laughs> you um, don't want to choose one of the ports that's used for other well-known protocols. So you just want to... <laughs> sure. Yeah. you know, pick a port that's not already being used for something else. But in general, there's not a very limited number of ports that you need to select from. It's, it's pretty broad. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, so yeah, I think Chris was, someone was pointing out, Chris was maybe asking about the remote admin mode. So if you're the remote producer, you could then, just to make sure that as a remote producer, you could control the network side on both uh, your guest and your production computer. And of course, you might not have access to that remote router like you cannot get access to the router through Perl but you could certainly configure Perl to go through any available port on the network yeah and one thing we can add there is is Perl is not using uh, when the remote producer is reaching out to that Perl at the edge the Perl mini at the guest location it's not using SRT to do that we have right, a secure right. tunnel uh, between our AV studio which is a cloud-based uh, software and the the Pearl Mini itself. So there's a secure tunnel that's established there and that's how they communicate. So so that goes through, you know, your standard encrypted HTTP ports. Um, so that's very easy, uh, works very well. And then once you're in there, then you can configure all the SRT settings and get that up and running. And you shouldn't need access to that person's router in order to make configuration changes on the router itself. Right. Um, and. We're almost done with our port chat here. Um, was there another one here? Oh, I think we got it all. Uh, someone was asking how many streams Perl 2 can receive. Uh, so uh, we're going to get streams. Yeah, we're going to get to that. We have a slide, so I'll, I'll hold Great. off on that one and, okay. and we're going to get to that. 
Um, maybe now I'll just talk a little bit about the statistics because this is an important kind of aspect of SRT is you do get the feedback. Um, so it will tell you what your round trip time is. Uh, it will tell you what the latency that you've requested is. And so this was the trade-off that we were talking about before where you can say, okay, I can deal with this much latency. Let's use that latency to guard against any packet loss or retransmissions that have to occur and to smooth out the jitter. Um, so that's something that you can set when you, when you create your connection, you can choose that latency. And there are some simple formulas. It's kind of a function of the round trip time of how large you set that latency to ideally. Um, but Perl has some sensible kind of defaults that work over many kind of network connections. And then from there, if you really want to get into it, you can kind of go and look at those formulas and fine tune things. If you've got a really well behaved network that has extremely low packet loss, you could crank that that latency down very low. If you know instead you've got a, a, a network that's got high packet loss and it shows you, you know, what the packet loss ratio is. So you can kind of see that and go, oh, I, I seem to have more packet loss on this particular network. I can increase that latency to compensate a little bit. So having these feedback, having this, the, the actual destination that's receiving the SRT stream feed this back to you uh, helps you to set it up in the first place. And there's just a couple parameters, really just the latency is the one that you're using to trade off for whatever packet loss or large round trip time you might have in your particular network. Mm -hmm. um, and just to clarify a few last little details. So this is UDP, we're talking about UDP ports um, yes. that we're going through. And it's not peer to peer, Alex. Um, the, the Epifan hosted tunnel we were talking about is really just a specific tunnel that we have so that you can control a Perl. Uh, however, any of the video streaming that you do from a Perl doesn't go through that tunnel. It's just a, a dedicated Correct. port uh, tunnel for controlling only. Um, so carry on, Dave. This is pretty neat. Uh, uh, seeing all these statistics I know coming in on my Perl here that I can see how well my stream is doing and see the health of it uh, right on my encoder. This is new. Uh, we've never had this before, but with RTMP or other protocols. So it's quite nice to see a very low packet loss when you're, when you're streaming and then be able exactly. to control it and adjust it, right? Yeah, and that's the big idea. I mean, especially if you're setting up and this remote guest isn't one you've had before or they've or it's one you, you've had before, but their network is quite unpredictable. One day it might behave really well. One day it may not. It allows you, you know, before the broadcast starts to be able to look at these statistics and tune that up and be able to say, OK, we're going to need a, to accommodate a little bit more latency here because of the packet loss that we're seeing. Or maybe it's a longer round trip time than usual. Um, but you can adjust the protocol and get it set up so that you'll have a good quality stream um, and you won't have to worry too much about about things going wrong. Mm -hmm. There is, uh, in the settings, there's also encryption, of course. So the secure part of SRT uh, does involve encryption. Um, and you can select uh, different key sizes, you know, up to 256-bit. Um, AES is the, is the encryption protocol. So very standard kind of uh, encryption uh, for internet transport. Um, and that's really all you need. Uh, the very last parameter there is what they call the recovery bandwidth overhead. Um, and this really is there to say how, how much of the bandwidth that, that the protocol can see available do you want to use for retransmission? And so again, this is another um, part of the protocol you can tune a little bit once you've seen what kind of packet loss you have. Mm -hmm. If your packet loss is high, you're gonna need a decent amount of, of overhead bandwidth to be able to retransmit those packets because of course, while you're retransmitting those packets, you're sending kind of the live packets at the same time. So you need a little bit of bandwidth above, you know, if you're sending out at a five meg connection, you're gonna need more bandwidth than that in order to account for those retransmissions. And you can fine tune that. So again, if you've got a network that's very well behaved, extremely low uh, packet loss, then you don't need so much overhead. Um, but if you're on something that's losing packets at a, at a much higher rate, then you're gonna to wanna to tweak that. So Again, it's, it's, there's some sensible kind of default values built right into Perl that you can just get up and running with. Um, but if you want to tune the, the protocol uh, further, uh, you have all the statistics and the knowledge here to be able to go in and, and tweak things and get even better performance out of, out of it and not just 
not just the default kind of average connection. Mm -hmm. So let me just make a note to everybody who's watching here on Crowdcast. Uh, there's lots of great questions going in the chat window here, and I was keeping up with them for a while, but there's a lot more. So we will be sure to either address your questions as we go on through these next slides, or at the very end of the, the when we're done with this presentation part of the show, we'll, have, we'll go through all the questions and make sure we cover them. So uh, just stay tuned and we'll get to it. Okay. Um, and this was the chart. Sorry, I don't remember the person's name, but someone was asking how many instances of SRT can we receive or can we transmit on, on our devices? And that's what, what this chart is showing. So depending on whether you're looking at a Perl Mini or a Perl 2, there are different amounts of uh, you know connections that you can support in parallel. So for the Perl 2, it's, it's 6 and 6. And for the Perl Mini, it's 1 and 3. Um, so depending on how many, you know, if you need to bring in multiple guests uh, and switch and mix and stuff, Perl 2 is probably uh, the best choice there. But you can certainly, if you have only one guest, you can certainly bring that in on a mini um, and do the production directly on the mini. So it really depends uh, what your uh, kind of situation is, how many guests you're bringing in. Um, but there are different kind of capabilities. You can see, you know, in terms of the the caller modes or the connection modes, they're all the same. And in terms of the encryption, it's the same on both platforms. It's really just the number of simultaneous SRT streams you can accommodate is different on Perl Mini versus Perl 2. Right. Um, and that gets us to our questions section. Um, so I think there was one question we anticipated because we get it on almost every webinar. And that was, how are we using SRT today in our setup? How are we configured? Um, George, you mentioned we're both at home and we're going through a Perl 2 that's in our Ottawa office. Um, so we do have a slide already prepared that we can walk through that because I'm sure somewhere in the questions people are asking, can you show me exactly what you guys are doing today? Mm -hmm. um, and this, this slide kind of shows that. I don't know, do you want to describe what what we're seeing here? Sure. So if you think of just as a three individuals here on this broadcast, so I'm in my house and I'm on the right hand side here and I am running a Pearl Mini and I have a, uh, and a mirrorless camera plugged into it. I also have a mic, this USB mic going into that camera. And then from that Mini, I'm broadcasting to our production Pearl 2. So I've set up an, an SRT stream to broadcast my camera and mic image into this Pearl 2. And then on the other side, Dave is doing the same thing. In his house, he's got a Pearl Mini and he's broadcasting over SRT into this Pearl 2, which is in our Ottawa office. Um, Cameron, our producer, is controlling that Pearl Mini. So he's composing all these beautiful layouts that you're looking at. And he's doing the switching for us and he's basically managing everything that needs to be done for this broadcast. And one of the questions here um, in the chat here was people asking about the uh, how are we doing the audio for this? So how am I hearing Dave and how is Dave hearing I? Uh, you could do this through SRT entirely if you wished. You, we, we could set up so that I'm not only sending an SRT stream uh, of my feed, my camera image here, I could be receiving a confidence monitor feed from that Pearl 2 production uh, computer. Right. Uh, however, the latency on that is a I would say it's a little bit higher than Zoom. And so yes. while the latency is quite low, like we have done it, we had done it, done it for our previous broadcasts when we've done those little short snippets. Um, it's not quite as good as you'd get either by having a phone call or having a Zoom call. So what we're doing instead is having a separate computer. So I have a laptop in front of me running a Zoom call. So that way I can uh, hear Dave almost instantaneously and vice versa. So we've chosen to separate our communications workflow uh, with our uh, contribution workflow, if that makes sense. Yep. Yeah, and it works very well to have that confidence monitor and for me to be interacting with you directly over Zoom. It's a very kind of familiar way to just converse with someone. And then in parallel, like you said, I've got my camera yes. and my mic mm -hmm. plugged into my Pearl Mini and that's sending it off to the to the production Pearl 2 in our Ottawa office. Um, there's a so few other it, advantages too, like that fact that our, our producer is on this call. So he can jump in right now and say, George, your audio is too low. And I'll hear it, right. but it won't be put into the broadcast. 
Yeah. So, yeah, so that back kind of nice channel. Thing about having no separation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that back channel comes in very handy. <laughs> yeah, right. he's telling me to keep my dog quiet right now. <laughs> so, um, yeah, it's, it looks like a lot of elements maybe on this chart, but it's actually fairly simple. We've got basically a Zoom call going between the three of us, and then George and I each have a Pearl Mini that we're putting our camera and microphone into, and then mm -hmm. Cameron's managing the whole production. So it's actually a fairly easy workflow uh, and very simple to set up. Um, yeah. So that's that's one question we anticipated, but let's let's get to some of the others. Sure. Um, so. I think it's this is Alex again. Alex Jacobs uh, was talking about are we going to talk about return feeds? So in our case, we're not doing return feeds via SRT, but you totally could, Alex. It's just that you're going to have to deal with slightly higher latency than you would get at uh, with a Zoom call. And yep. it also means you're at the mercy of that latency for all of your broadcast as well. So if you choose that you wanted a little bit more latency for your SRT stream just to ensure a higher quality and less packet drop, you're gonna suffer the consequences of having a you know, poor communication workflow there. So that brings up another good point that somebody mentioned about Dave, what about mix minus? So maybe first, could you just give the audience a little bit of an overview of what we're talking about with mix minus and how it's mitigated in a setup like what we're doing today? Yeah, so mix minus, the idea is that, you know, when multiple people are on a, either a voice conference or a broadcast, um, their audio is all being fed to a central place. So if you're on a Zoom call, that's all going into to Zoom and then it's being distributed back out. And what you don't wanna hear as a participant in that call or as a remote guest on the broadcast is your own voice coming back to you in what you're hearing. You want to hear the other participants on the broadcast, but you don't wanna hear yourself, particularly if there's a little bit of delay. And there's always, even with Zoom or with any communication, when you're going up to a server and back, regardless of where that server is located, there will be some delay and it's quite annoying to hear your own voice coming back delayed. So mm -hmm. the minus in the mix minus is basically, I hear all of the audio from that call for all the participants minus my own. And so it's important when you're sending uh, a, a confidence channel or, or a contribution channel back to the, the remote guest or the participant that it not include their own audio in the mix. Um, and so one of the ways we're getting around that right here is we could do that um, in the Pearl. So Cameron could be creating specific channels that he feeds to me and he feeds a different one to George and George does not hear his audio. He only hears mine or, or whomever else is on the call. So it is possible with, with the Pearl 2 to create multiple channels and use specific channels with specific audio um, back to the, the guest. Um, but what we're doing is Zoom already kind of accommodates that in a very elegant way where you don't have to kind of create all those extra channels. So that's just a simpler way that we've chosen to do it today is the audio that I'm hearing from George is kind of that mix minus from Zoom but Zoom is doing that for me. And likewise, George is not hearing himself come back from Zoom because Zoom is taking him out of that mix that he receives. So mm -hmm. it's something that, that the conferencing software does automatically. It is something you would have to do on your own if you were going to create that, that confidence view back or that interaction view back um, to the guest. So you do have to create a, a minus one mix for the audio that's going back. Mm -hmm. And we're using earbuds today, so that helps us mitigate having to have it. If I had my computer speakers on right now, we would have an, an echo problem of my own voice. So um, I'm excited to see where that goes, because I think there's more work to be done there uh, uh, to make that workflow even easier for people. But uh, we'll get to that later. This yep. is day, day, day zero for us with SRT. So yeah. Um, Okay, uh, so if you have any more questions, please put them into the chat here. Uh, as, I, as I mentioned, we've done the presentation part, part, of, the, part of the program today. So uh, if you wanna stick around and, and talk more for a while, we'll stick around as long as you're here and as long as we've answered all the questions. Um, and uh, there's also these polls here that we put in. So um, I'm trying to think, is there any last questions here that we asked? Does a Perl system uh, seem to meet your, your needs for SRT encoding and decoding? People are saying, 
uh, the bulk of the votes are somewhat. So 61% okay. say somewhat, 50 per, or five votes are, are saying yes. So, and nobody's saying no, so that's a good thing. But we'd love to know what your needs are. So what is the SRT workflow that you're looking for? Um, we could really use that feedback as well. So, um, yeah. So if you do have specific feedback there where you're either you're not sure if Perl supports what you need or you, or you gather that it doesn't, uh, we'd love to hear from you if you can send it just at info at epifan.com uh, and just let us know what, what it is you're requiring that you think our system may, may not have for you. Um, we'd love to hear that feedback and of course if, if it is something that Perl supports or there's a workaround that's, that's fairly simple. Um, we can help you with that, um, but we'd love to hear your feedback if there's something in the in the Perl 2 and the Perl Mini that we could add to make it better for your specific productions. Mm -hmm. um, by all means, let us know. Just send us a, an email at info at epifan.com and we read them all. Uh, we have a nice comment here from Dante talking, sorry, not from Dante, sorry, from David talking about how he uses Dante with his Yamaha QL5 to manage the mix minus. So you might yep. do your mix minus operation completely separate from your SRT production altogether. Yes, you could do that. And, and uh, I mean, there's lots of benefits to go into a, a separate mixer to do that as well. Um, but yeah, if you've got something like a nice Yamaha mixer with Dante Audio. It's a fantastic way to do mm -hmm. that. Uh, another nice comment from Alex here talking about the idea of how to manage that PowerPoint presentation. So Dave, before I, I get into this comment, maybe you could tell us, tell the people how we're doing our PowerPoint display today. Right, so um, the way we're doing it is I'm on the laptop that I'm using that's running the Zoom call uh, where I'm communicating with George and with Cameron. I'm also sharing slides um, from my laptop on Zoom. And then Cameron has taken those slides, taken that output that we receive on on a, a computer in the, in the studio. So that's mm -hmm. terminating that Zoom call. He'll take that, that HDMI from the, uh, from the, it's actually a Mac that's sitting in the studio that's terminating that Zoom call. We feed HDMI from that Mac into the Perl 2, and that's how the slides that are really on my machine here make it up into the production. So we could have Cameron just providing those slides or George providing the slides. Um, we just decided today it would be me and that we would do it over Zoom. Um, another alternative is I could send a second SRT feed into Perl 2 that has the slides, and then Cameron could be switching it in from there. So there are a few ways you can do it. The way we chose to do it uh, today was just through Zoom. It has a very easy way to share, uh, you know, slide content. And then Cameron just takes that feed directly from the machine that's terminating the Zoom call and feeds that over HDMI directly into our Perl 2 for the production. Right. Um, Alex is suggesting another way that uh, by using the GPIO pins on Perl, to remotely advance slides on a computer running a presentation. So this is some kind of a skunk works mm. uh, idea, but, a, but it is a nice idea. And I know uh, getting a, a way to remotely manage your slide presentation so I don't have to run it on my home computer here and instead I can just trigger it somehow would be really powerful. Yep, that's a great idea. Um, mm -hmm. It's not supported yet, but something we can look at. Okay, uh, another question. What bit rate are you using for the SRT transmission? So I think I'm using f about five megabits uh, for my SRT. Is that what you're using, Dave? Uh, mine is a little lower, so I'm actually at about 3.8, 3.7 okay. megabits, but I'm sending, um, I'm sending 720. Uh, I think you're sending 1080. That's so right. again, it's, it's just a matter of uh, I don't have a great internet connection here at home and I'm sending the slides on Zoom and then I'm sending my SRT. So mm -hmm. I've opted for something that was a little less um, on the bandwidth side. And then, uh, you know, I scaled down to 720 to accommodate that. So mine's at about 3.5 or 3.7 meg. I love this because this is the first time I've ever been able to confidently know. I can test out exactly what megabits I want. I can dial in, you know, 5,000 kilobits try it out and I'll immediately see, oh, I've got a 6% packet loss. 
And right. I'll think, well, that's not so great. So I can either adjust my latency, like increase it to allow for that larger pipe, or I can just lower my, my bit rate a little bit. And you, to get that kind of feedback in those statistics is so helpful when setting up a live stream. It gives you the confidence to know it's going to work. Um, exactly. Yeah, so I like that. Uh, here's another question. I need a good way to get the SRT out of SDI into my switcher. Hoping Perl is the answer. Oh, this is an early question from Alex. So he wants to go from an SDI source to be able to transmit that as SRT, if I understand that. No, correctly. he wants to get the SRT out via SDI into his switcher. So he wants an, SD, an SRT, sorry, an SDI out. Ah, so he needs okay. some kind of a encoder. Now our Perl systems offer HDMI out. We don't do our output over SDI, but you could use a converter if you, if you, if you chose, uh, in which case Perl would, would, would fit, your, fit your bill. Yeah, yeah um, you just need to convert that HDMI. Oh. Yaroslav is asking if any of the EPFEN products support uh, NDI. Um, yes. <laughs> yep. Yes, yeah, so, so the Perl 2 does. Uh, the Perl Mini does not. Uh, it's something that it may in the future. We're looking at that. Um, but right now, the Perl 2 does support NDI, uh, both, again, both uh, as a receive, so we can receive NDI from an NDI camera or some other NDI source as well as we can transmit NDI out um, to, to a, an NDI receiver. On the transmission side of Perl, uh, it's, it's NDI, it's kind of native NDI. On mm -hmm. the receive side, uh, we can either take NDI or NDI Ajax. So we've got lots of flexibility in the Perl 2 to bring in NDI feeds as well as to send them out. Um, and I don't know the numbers off the top of my head, but a quick glance in the manual would answer the question of how many NDI feeds could we support simultaneously? I don't remember, but it's it's multiple on Perl too. Um, okay, I'm, I'm, the reason I'm looking down here is because I'm just looking through some of the questions here. People are asking when this firmware is coming out, Dave. Do we have an update on that? I don't have an exact date, um, but we're kind of mid-June right now. I would say by the end of the month, uh, we certainly expect it to be out. Okay. We're in the final stages here of just kind of tidying up uh, the last couple things and going through our final verification testing. So we expect within the next, I'll say two to three weeks, we certainly expect it to be out in that time frame. Mm -hmm. So someone's asking uh, how Microsoft Teams is implementing SRT so that they can integrate with Perl 2. I don't think we don't we don't know how they're going to integrate set up SRT, but it'll be easy, and I've no doubt that it'll work with uh, Perl too. Um, so we're looking forward to that as well. I know other co conferencing tools have talked about using SRT as well. So hopefully we see a bit of a wave of of people being able to send SRT signals. Yep. Um, here's a question from David: Are most CDNs supporting SRT now as an alternative to RTMP? Maybe you I could would, speak to that. Yeah, I wouldn't say most uh, yet. Uh, there certainly are some. I mean, obviously, Wowza uh, with their their Wowza streaming cloud uh, supports it. Um, Microsoft Azure uh, does support it. Um, I I wouldn't say most. I would say people are starting to adopt it, and for us, that was that was the momentum we needed to see to kind of build it into our products, and so. While I can't say most do right now, I can say that many are working on it. And I expect if we had this conversation six months from now, then the list would be quite long. For um, sure. So I think it's it's coming very rapidly to a lot of uh, platforms and products as we speak. Um, so we're not super early to the game, but we're not we're not late to the game either. The, it's not it's not something that's everywhere yet, but it's it's growing very, very quickly. Mm -hmm. Uh, there's a couple of general questions here about our production. People are wondering how we're doing our switching and our graphics and stuff. So maybe I'll just spend a minute here and tell you what you're watching today. So sure. you're seeing our, Dave and I are both using remote, uh, or in our remote, remote locations, sending an SRT feed just of our camera image to another Pearl 2. This Pearl 2 is in our studio and um, our, with Pearl 2, you can compose layouts. So this layout that you're looking at right now is our producer Cameron, he's able to adjust the size and crop and do whatever he wants with those images, add background images as well. And then he can do switching between those different layouts. So that's how the switching is being done. And the uh, graphics that you're seeing on screen, like this title that's just shown up now, 
that is being done through another computer running NewBlueFX. So NewBlueFX is a, a graphics program and it is being fed into Perl 2 over NDI. So we employ NDI for this because NDI supports an alpha channel. So um, it's, a, it's a mix of different technologies, but the heart of it all is a Perl 2, which does all the compositing, the layouts, and handling all the audio video sources. And then, like I said, we use NDI for our graphics. So that's kind of what you're looking at here today. I'm just picking, now I'm picking up here through the comments here. So if you have any more questions, throw them into the chat. Um, <laughs> Dave, here's one. So what exactly makes SRT look so good? <laughs> uh, well, I think so good means you're basically you're using a, a decent codec in the first place at a, at a reasonable bit rate. That's that's the first thing. I think when we say so good, I think normally people are then talking relative to something like conferencing software like Zoom. And mm -hmm. in that case, it's all about the amount of bandwidth and the codec uh, choice that's being used and the ability uh, of SRT to retransmit packets that are lost. So it looks very seamless and it, it kind of accommodates for the jitter and the natural packet loss that exists in, in the networks. So that's what helps to make it look so good. When you start losing packets or you have a lot of jitter uh, in the packets that are being arrived, the, the device that's trying to play that video out has a very challenging job of making that video look good and, and smooth um, with really high quality. And so that's, that's how SRT does that, is it makes sure that it's got a packet retransmission that's on top of kind of that UDP layer that we talked about earlier. Um, so it's handling all of the retransmission and uh, it's it's smoothly handled compensating for a lot of the jitter that's happening in the network as well which can also make your your resultant video if if it's not handled well it looks kind of jumpy or skippy um, sure sure so so SRT does a very good job and it, and it was built to do that right some of these other protocols uh, we mentioned UDP or TCP they really weren't developed with video in mind uh, SRT was and so that's really why it does such a a better job is it it started from from inception to be a video transport protocol mm -hmm. here's another question for you dave so alex again is asking can we line up or change the srt inputs on the fly so can you have four srt guests lined up and then while they're broadcasting start setting up your other srt guests and just be cycling through different guests throughout the day so i'm maybe maybe alex is thinking of a conference where you have right. a session after session and you're you're just onboarding and green rooming the next batch of people who are coming on while the other people are live yeah so you could do that uh in a pearl 2 quite easily so you just establish your next srt connection let's say you have two guests on and you want to you want to replace one of them with a third guest um you just establish the new connection with that third guest and then you start modifying your layouts to bring in uh that guest rather than the second guest, the one you're getting rid of. Um, so it's a two-step process. You get that SRT connection with the third person, and then you create layouts or modify your existing layouts to bring that person in instead of the other one. And once you've done that, then you can kind of get rid of the original SRT connection and you're back down to two SRT connections. And you can keep doing that as long as you don't exceed the six SRT connections that Pearl can support, you can bring in guests and it's up to you uh, sort of which layouts you work them into and when you make those those layouts live. So it's more of a workflow uh, question of how you do that. But yes, Perl can, can absolutely do that. Great. Uh, here's a, I guess I have sort of a basic question here. Uh, is there a limitation with SRT and that it can't do two-way communication? That's from Armando. We've covered this already, but we can answer that now again. Yeah, I, I would say it could, it could do two-way communication and we have done so i think if you have a if you have a really good network so very low packet loss and jitter you can tune the latency down to the point where it's very good and equivalent to something like zoom but it does require a really good network so let's say you mm -hmm. were in um, two buildings on the same campus and you have a dedicated network and that's very well managed uh, certainly that could be possible um, but i think 
if you're doing what we're doing today, which is George is in his house and I'm in my house and the, the Pearl 2 that we're talking to is in our, um, our studio at our office, um, it's a little more challenging to get a network connection that you can reduce the latency down to the point where you have a really natural kind of flow to the conversation. So there's nothing inherent at SRT um, that prevents you from using it in two-way communication. The only thing that's limiting you there is the network. And so the tool that SRT gives you to, to mitigate against packet loss is latency. And as you increase that latency, it makes that real-time communication or two-way communication a little more difficult. So on a great network between two people, you could absolutely do it. But in general, uh, if that network is unpredictable or has you know, large packet loss, it's difficult to get the latency down low enough uh, to make it as smooth as something as, say, Zoom or, or other conferencing sure. software. Sure, right, okay. Um, here's another one for you. Is it possible to do a point-to-point -point streaming using four SRT separate streaming channels? Do you understand that question? I, I'm not sure uh, that I do. I th I'm, I'm not sure I understand what they're trying to... So can you repeat the question? Is it possible to do a point-to-point -point streaming using four SRT separate channels? Um, I, I think if I interpret that correctly, they may be asking, could I send, say, to four different CDN destinations, whatever, at, well, for four different remote sources that are sending it over SRT. Um, I think if that's what they're asking, then I'm not sure we could do four because you, that would be four in and four out of Perl, which is probably too much for Perl too. Um, but I'm not, I'm not certain I understand the question. You can certainly bring in four and switch them together and stream one out or, or a couple out, but probably four in and four out is, is too much for, for mm -hmm. Perl too. If, if that's what's asking, you could certainly use two Perl twos and do two on one <laughs> and two on the other. Um, but I'm just not sure. So the, there's nothing inherent in the protocol that's limiting that. It's just the horsepower of, yes, of the right. box to be able to receive and transmit all of those SRT streams. Mm -hmm. So forgive me, I'm, I'm working through all these comments and I'm not sure which ones are first or last. And, and there's quite a few in here. So I hope we've answered most of them. If you have questions, I'm gonna, I'm gonna say, if you have any final questions, please put them in now because I think we're gonna wrap up shortly. Um, yeah. I see one here that I, we've addressed already, but we'll answer it one more time because I see there's a lot of upvotes on this question, so it's popular at least. How are you handling the return feed for the remote contributors? What protocol, what picture, audio, producer comms, et cetera. And I think we addressed that already by just letting you know, we're doing that all through Zoom. So it's a completely separate channel over here. And as we mentioned, right. we could do it over SRT, but um, I can say personally, I like the fact that it's entirely separate because it means I don't have to worry about my contribution workflow being compromised by trying to use the same um, equipment and tools and everything for my contribution as my return feed. Yep. Uh, but yep. like I said, there's a lot of ways to do that return feed stuff. So we'll be interested to see what people come up with over the next few weeks. And one last thing we may show before we go, um, Cameron Dable, is we can show you the difference in quality because we are using Zoom as our kind of way of uh, connecting with one another. We do have a channel that's Zoom based. There you go. So you can see this is this is our this is Zoom uh, being fed into the Pearl two, and you can see the quality difference, probably both in terms of the the video and the audio uh, that you're hearing. Um, and so this is the way we would traditionally have done our webinars. And by traditionally, I mean before today. <laughs> uh, this is yeah. today is the first time we've done it where all of the contribution feeds are are through SRT, so that you're getting that high quality audio and and video. Previously, we were using Zoom as the way to bring in contribution, and so you can see the difference um, that it makes if you set up a couple SRT feeds. And as George mentioned, we're just using Zoom to converse back and forth so we get a nice natural conversation. And then those SRT feeds in parallel to the Zoom are going going, going to the Ottawa office, to the Pearl 2, and that's where Cameron can switch us in and get a much nicer version. 
Um, you notice George's camera view changed there. Uh, that's because he's using one camera for zoom and one camera for the SRT encoding. I'm using the same camera split, so that's why the, the kind of viewpoint didn't change on mine. You got the same camera just sent over zoom versus over SRT. Mm -hmm. So that is a great demo. I love to see the difference in quality there. Yours is a true apples to apples comparison of zoom versus uh, SRT. Uh, whereas mine is a bit of an AB comparison because it's different camera, different audio source, but nonetheless, the quality uh, improvement is quite obvious. Um, so just to let everybody know who's watching or who still watching, um, thanks for being with us today. This presentation will be available for uh, VOD watching. Just go to our website, go to the webinars page there, and it'll be posted there. It's also posted to YouTube uh, as a VOD asset there. Um, if you would like a copy of the slides that we spoke about today, just reach out on our live chat or our, uh, any, any ways to talk to us through support, social, anything like that, and we'll post those for you as well. Um, we, we're going to have a lot more SRT-related content over the next couple of weeks. Um, on Thursday of this week at 3 o'clock, if you find us on YouTube or Facebook, we're going to be having a little bit more casual conversation and we'll probably experiment a bit more on how to do remote guest setup. So we'll walk through a few of the different options. We'll talk about a lot of the things we talked about today. But if you want some more of this, um, check us out on YouTube. In fact, we're there every Thursday at three o'clock Eastern time where we'll be talking about remote guest contributions and all kinds of things to do with live video. So be sure to tune in there. Uh, we also have a whole slate of webinars coming up as well. So again, it's on our website. So um, I think we've gone through all the questions, Dave. Um, Great. Some nice feedback by everybody who's wa been watching today. So um, awesome. thanks to you for helping out here. This is great. My pleasure. It was great. And uh, that's our first That's our first SRT uh, fully, fully done. There we go. That's right. It works. It, it hasn't broken yet. We should get off the air before uh, you just jinxed it entirely, right? That's right. Um, <laughs> we're going to get hit by an anvil or something like that. Yeah. Um, okay. Thanks for watching, everybody. Okay. Take care.